Welcome to another episode of the Miles Offside Podcast, where we talk a little bit of football and a whole lot of nonsense. My name is Oscar Puente, also known as Free From Afar, and with me, as always, is my co-host, super producer, Ian Stimson. Ian, we have a very special guest this week. I don't know if you know. I mean, he is on the Skype call with us, but you may not have noticed because you're very old. <laughs> mm-hmm. Joining us for the second time in the history of this podcast, first time in about three years almost, something like that, is the one, the only, the Arsenal fan, Adam P. Adam, it's our first time on the fucking show together. Last time you were on, you were replacing me. This time you were replacing Chuck. How are you feeling? I'm good, thanks. I feel like I've now got a lot to uh, not a lot to live up to. Uh, although I suppose being known as the Arsenal fan isn't exactly high praise, but um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. it's great to be on, guys. Introduced as singular as well, the <laughs> Arsenal fan. Well, you know, there's not many left at this point. Certainly not listening to this podcast anymore. Well, that's probably true. Yeah, Adam, one of our oldest fans. You've been around since basically day one. Tell the people a little bit about yourselves for those that may have missed your appearance in season one. Uh, yeah, so um, my name's Adam. I have been a long-suffering fan of the miles offside podcast <laughs> uh i think affectionately known as the human punching bag back in the day thanks uh thanks to jeff for like slightly <laughs> taking that role off me um but yeah no i guess I, I don't really know how to describe myself other than a long-suffering fan of both the podcast and of arsenal well there you go that's a pretty perfect introduction uh, if you are joining us for the first time, then thank you. We are very happy to have you. We are one American and two Brits, and we try to talk about the Premier League, but often get distracted. Uh, and if you're coming back, thanks. We love it. Spread the word. Leave us a review. Join us on Patreon. All that good stuff. Uh, and we will kick things off as we usually do around here with our famous segment. <coughs> rapid, rapid, rapid fire news. Our top story this evening, the big one. That's right, Watford have fired yet another manager. <laughs> Watford have appointed Claudio Ranieri as their new manager after sh- sacking Shisco Munoz on Sunday. The Italian, 69, nice, returns to the Premier League, which he famously won with Leicester in 2015-16 after leaving the Serie A side Sampdoria in the summer. They've given him a two-year contract, gentlemen. Do we think that he will make it to the end of the two years? Let's start there. Well, I, I just want to wish you happy new Watford manager day. Um... It's just, it's just the most the wonderful most time of the year. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know which, which bit's your favourite. I like the decorations that you put up at the start of the start of the Premier League season to get ready for this. Uh, you get all the family round and you ask who's going to be the next Watford manager and uh, Tiny Tim says Antonio Conte because he's an idiot and kids don't know anything about <laughs> football. Um, but just, it's, it's, it's so lovely, isn't it? It always comes around, sometimes twice a year. Um, but uh, what was your question, Oscar? I had that prepared. <laughs> Does he make the two years? Do you think he makes the two years? Of course he doesn't make the fucking two years. That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> I, um, uh, I said something like um, the Watford managerial position in terms of contract length is a bit like dog years, except the opposite. So <laughs> it's a two-year contract, but in Watford terms, that means about sort of, I don't know, 17 weeks or so. So yeah, yeah I can't... I mean, I think everyone loves Claudio Ranieri as a guy he seems like a really really nice bloke but I don't I don't really know if he's the kind of person that is much of like a firefighter type manager I don't know maybe that's just the impression I have I don't get the sense that Watford care what type of manager they get they just need someone there to fire in a few weeks like just a warm body at this point what this is you're suggesting this is like their 10th caretaker yeah something like that probably I did read somewhere that um, Watford have fired and I think they fired a manager in every year from like dating way back to like 2011 or something like that. And I remember there was one season where they had like three. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, they certainly got form. And other than like an extremely large pay packet, I don't really know why he would take this job. Like, it seems like a he's on a hiding to nothing, really. Uh, maybe he needs a second house or something. He just wanted to pay out. You know, he'll, he'll work eight matches and then get two years worth of salaries. It's not a bad deal, if you ask me. I don't know if you saw Chuck posted the, uh, the upcoming fixtures, and their next eight are, like, atrocious. They're all, like, bright red on FPL. And it's like, they have City, <laughs> they have Chelsea, they have Liverpool in there. Really atrocious. So I don't know if he's going to make it very far. Well, it'll, that's the thing, though. It's a weird time to do it, but then at the same time, do you go go through those fixtures knowing that you're going to get three points from eight games, maybe? 
That's or do generous. you get someone new and hope, well, yeah, maybe. But and or do you get someone new and just hope for a, a dead cat new manager bounce? <laughs> I don't know which cat. one of those. One of the two for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, was it even fair to fire the last one? I don't bother learning what Watford manager's name is. I don't know anything like, about him. <laughs> yeah, did he do a good job? I haven't watched Watford this season yet. Had a hit with the thong song a little while ago, but I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah. remember. Any, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know anything else. Adam, as the resident, uh, as the filling in for Chuck, as the fan of the lower half team this season. Um, <laughs> Jesus there Christ. There it is, big number one. Uh, how did the Watford manager do? Like, was it a fair sacking? What do you think? I don't think Watford are doing terribly. They beat Aston Villa on the opening day, and they looked pretty good in that game. I guess Villa weren't exactly amazing. Um my sort of analysis of Watford extends to the fact that in his last post-match interview, Munoz was wearing a really nice roll neck jumper, mm, mm, like a nice mm. burgundy yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. thing. And Ranieri's not exactly like a Pulis kind of cap wearing Luddite, but you know, we need a bit more sartorial elegance in the Premier League. So I'm kind of upset he's gone for that alone. Yeah, especially after losing uh, the Fulham manager from last year, Scott Parker. He was extremely well-dressed. He should be the next Bond, actually. There's your answer right there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer to the question no one was asking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on then to our next story. Uh, former Liverpool and England striker Daniel Sturridge has signed for Australian club Perth Glory for the 21-22 season. The 32-year-old had been without a club since leaving Turkish club Trubzbans... Tra- Trabzonspor? Not sure how to pronounce that one. Uh, in March 2020. Uh, so since the lockdown, Danny Sturridge has just been lonely and sad and jobless. And he finally got himself a job. So that's got to feel pretty nice. How are things down in Australia? Aren't they in like some sort of like extreme lockdown at the moment? Like you can't travel between regions and stuff like that. So All right. So not good times then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not exactly what I call falling on your feet. but um... <laughs> He's gone to soak up a bit of culture and that and can't go anywhere or do anything. Yeah, lovely. I mean, you don't go to Australia to soak up culture. Sorry, Dave, but just <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we think he'll succeed down there like is there still a revival for him is this like a swan song at the end of his career why did he yeah, choose australia one. instead of mls that, like, <laughs> that one the swan song one the swan song i mean okay, okay, yeah okay. come on it's not you don't go there for career progression do you I mean, well, maybe i'm maybe i'm doing the australian league a massive disservice i don't think i am they've had like a litany of great english strikers i mean emil heskey was there for a bit wasn't he at the newcastle jets club um Emil Heskey was there for a bit of the Newcastle <laughs> Jets club, so... Okay, I'm still waiting for the great England strikers also. Are there any of those Don't around? Or? dare have a go at Emil Heskey. Oh, yeah? Was he good? What's his deal? <laughs> Tell me about Heskey. Educate me. I remember he was on Villa, right? I remember him being, like, really old on Villa. Yeah, just a big English unit. You know, the exact, the exact sort of player people my age like. You know? A proper footballer, you know, 4-4-2. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it should oh, be. <laughs> yeah. Him and Michael Owen, big man, little man, that's what you want. There it is. There it is. Was this like at the O two World Cup, O four Euros, thereabouts? Yeah, that's what's up. Uh, yeah. Twenty ten World Cup. Wasn't Heskey in the South Africa squad? Adam, are you old enough to remember that? Or uh, were you still in like in diapers at that point? How old would I have been then? Quite young. Probably too depressingly young and don't then you'll tell hate Ian. me. He does not yeah, I was gonna say that. I don't want to cause Ian to go into an existential crisis. <laughs> too late. I think there's like a fifteen year gap between the two of you, so let's not talk about <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, from one England player to another, uh, we have former England captain Terry Butcher has called for a gradual phasing out of heading in football to prevent catastrophic head injuries. The 62-year-old told the Sports Desk podcast that he believes it's something we can do without. Uh, last year, the family of, 1990, of 1966 World Cup winner Nobby Stiles said football needed to address the scandal of dementia in the game. Eventually, I want to see football with no heading, Butcher said. Uh, Ian, as the old resident traditional northern host of the podcast, okay, what are your thoughts on getting heading out? today, isn't it? Go on. <laughs> well, I want to be nice to Adam. You know, he's our guest and I can't dig at Chuck right now. So, you know, he's off <laughs> gallivanting in, in fucking France at the Marvel Hotel and, and all that shit. So I'm going to go at you a bunch. Uh, talk to me, resident old. How do you feel about phasing out heading from the game? Is it a travesty? Is it necessary? What do you think? You see, the thing is, I'm very aware of that sort of uh, status as a as a traditionalist and so you know while to me it does feel unthinkable to have the game without heading because that's how I grew up with it um it you know it probably will end up going that way eventually won't it because um they're not going to want to leave themselves exposed to lawsuits and things when it comes to uh, getting dementia later on in life when it when you know it can be directly traced to 
um, to sporting injuries or to heading of the ball. And I, I don't know, I think American football is sort of going a, a similar way with having to having to become safer and safer because it's, you know, there's no argument about the correlation between the game and early onset dementia and stuff. So I almost want to take a pass on this one because I, I know it's probably going to be the way it's heading eventually. Heading. I see what you yeah. did there. Nice one. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> yeah, lovely, thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's much a, a bluff old traditionalist like me can do can or should do about it, if that makes sense. All right. Uh, what about you, Adam? What's your take on the headers here? Uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because I sort of, I was... Um, I can't remember what game I was watching uh, with my dad, but we were talking about this idea and we uh, his initial reaction was that kind of more traditionalist view of, well, how could you have a game without headers? And then we watched a passage of play where there were no headers for about 15, 20 minutes. So I think football can happen without heading. I think one area where reducing sort of headers and heading contact makes complete sense is in training. Because, like, if yeah. you look at if in like sports like rugby, they've placed limits on the amount of sort of contact sessions they can have in training. So I think maybe if they were to say, uh, I don't know, like one, two session, two training sessions a week, one training session a week, you're allowed to head the ball. The other ones you aren't allowed to head the ball. Maybe that would make sense and do that for a season and sort of see what happens. But then again, the problem is, is that because it's sort of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and these sort of conditions that are affecting these people, you're not really going to see the kind of impact of it for another sort of 20, 30 years. So ultimately, as like sort of sad as all of these stories are, and I don't know if you watched uh, Alan Shearer's documentary he did on the BBC. I did not, it. no. It's, uh, if anyone out there hasn't watched it, I would recommend. It's, quite, it's really quite sad and moving as you sort of see a man come to the realization of the damage that he's caused himself essentially but um like i was saying you don't really see the impact of that until these players are retired so we're only going to know the impact of what is happening on current players bodies uh, in all aspects physique and heading in sort of like 20 years or so but uh but yeah i think the training idea reduce the amount of heading you can do in training it would make most sense to me certainly as a first step yeah i, I predictably closed the tab already <laughs> but um <laughs> the english medical association of football doctors or something like that let's say cool, uh, cool. did put yep. in rules for this year that they're allowed a maximum <clears throat> of 10 high force headers a week in training um i think huh. it's recommended not like required but they are already right, kind okay. of putting that sort of stuff in place um, but to me, I mean, I don't know if it's coming from an American sports thing, especially a basketball thing, but they kind of fuck around with the rules in basketball in really significant ways, not infrequently, maybe like once every 10 years, there's some like fundamental gameplay thing that happens. So like a long time ago, there was no shot clock. So teams would just keep the ball for minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes. And then the games were all really scoring. So they put in a rule that was like, you have to shoot at ball at the rim at the net within 24 seconds of getting possession, right? Like they require you to shoot at a certain speed. Uh, even in my lifetime, they changed the size of the ball and they put in a rule where you couldn't defend basically like right under the rim. So if someone's going up for a dunk and you try to get in their way, then that's called a uh, like defensive foul basically. So like you can't, you can only try to block a shot or defend a shot a certain distance away from the hoop, uh, which was like really, really hard for players because they pl they played that way for their entire lives. And then all of a sudden, like, well into their careers, they're like, oh, you're not allowed to do this thing that you've been training to do forever and ever and ever. Mm. And I don't know. I just don't have the historical context. Certainly not in the 15 years that I've been a Chelsea fan. Um, has there ever been anything like this fundamentally different that would, like, radically change not just how the game is played, but, like, just what, like, players are used to doing on a, every single day, every kind of game level? It's definitely in my memory that the back pass rule came in, where goalkeepers couldn't, you know, handle a back pass from a from their own defender. When did that come in, Adam? Are you old enough to remember the back pass rule, or is that where the the generational gap really does show here? I think that might be where the generational gap does. Oh yes, show. I'm so happy that happened. Thank you for that. Okay, it was 1992, so uh, yeah. Adam, do you I want was... to tell Ian how old you were in '92, or uh, is it going to make him cry? Uh, if I tell him I wasn't born yet, is that? 
Is that enough? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Just a, a glimmer in the milkman's eye. Um, I, I was eight, so I do remember it. Um, I, I can't say I particularly remember football beforehand, but yeah, the sort of to discourage the time wasting and everything. I do remember some immediately hilarious goals coming from you know goalkeepers having the ball played back to them and suddenly realising they can't pick it up and having yeah, to do yeah. something with their feet for once, which is obviously now. Goalkeepers play with their feet all the time. Going back to the heading thing, it's a. It will become easy to be phased out when because um, kids' football is doing it less and less. And soon yeah, it's it already uh, disallowed at U eleven level. So like that's that should just age up with them, I think. Yeah, so soon it will get banned higher up. You know, and those kids will right. all, all grow up playing the game without heading, and it it, it probably will. Uh, you know, come in sooner rather than later. To be honest, so. Yeah. Really, the only weird thing for me would be free kicks and corners. Like, I cannot picture yeah. what a corner would look like. Even a short corner usually ends up with a cross, right? So, like, yeah. what even... You lose value to corner kicks a lot that way. But they'd figure something out. I mean, it's fucking professional athletes. Like, they'll find a way to score on those. But other than that, like, Adam's right. Like, I don't really know how many headers happen in open play other than, like, trying to clear the ball in a defensive situation, which always just ends up with a head-to-head clash. Like, it's so dangerous. Yeah. Not even just hitting the ball, hitting each other's faces and heads and stuff. Like, I don't know. I think they should do it. I'm all for rule changes, though, in general. I just, <laughs> just chaos. Yeah, I, know you, I know you are, yeah. I just want to say as well at the start of this how uh, fun it was to hear you say Nobby Styles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I I hadn't pre-read that part of the story and it came across. I was like, ah, I must not it, laugh. It was clear it you were reading that for the first time out loud. <laughs> Consummate professional. That's what I am. That's what everyone says, right? Uh, (laughs) uh, let's go to one of the more sort of, I don't know, props to this guy stories. And that is Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp says he does not understand why some people refuse the coronavirus vaccine. There have been concerns about the rate of vaccination in the Premier League with fewer than half of the players jabbed at most clubs. Klopp says 99% of his players have been vaccinated. Meanwhile, Health Secretary Sajid Javid said it is disappointing at least five members of the England squad are reportedly refusing to be vaccinated. Um, It's not clear which clubs are the ones that have a lot of them or not, but I think there's a really valid point there. Just fuck off and get vaccinated if you can. Like if it's like medically unsound for you to do it because a doctor told you so, fine. Otherwise, do go get vaccinated if you can get vaccinated and you have not yet gotten vaccinated. Um, But what do you guys think? I mean, there's not really much to add there. I just wanted to praise Klopp for being like that. But do you think, isn't it insane to you that like so few fucking players have been vaccinated? Is that like, that seems insane to me. They're requiring it in American sports. So I don't think it's that weird, but like, what's the deal over there? What's up with that? Well, in all the big American sports, it's it's required. Uh, Or you're not allowed to play. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think that well, it might end up being the way they go, but it depends how many... Ultimately, they'll only care if fixtures start getting called off and stuff. So, And I don't know if we're there anymore, you know. But it's it's a weird one because I, I think there was a lot of um, Olympians who were unvaccinated as well and or, or only did so so as they could travel if it, if it turned out. And it's something to do with top level athletes and maybe not wanting to put something they're not sure about in their bodies but i mean it's it's not cool i mean it? they eat fucking horse placenta but they yes. won't take a vaccine that like billions of people are getting around the world like what okay let me drink this horse fetus so that my ankle feels a little bit better I'm, or fucking I'm, whatever i don't know how it works i don't know i'm actually... not arguing for or indeed against the uh, health benefits of horse placenta. Uh, I, I just, I just, I'm trying to find a reason why people who look after themselves in in sort of aspects of their health because of their job wouldn't do that unless they just feel like they're young and fit enough to deal with it. But it just, it, it yeah, it seems, it seems like you would have thought club doctors, their own people, would be advising them to get this done. It does, it does, it. The rates when you hear them are really startling to be honest and it's not like their fucking teammates aren't getting sick just at chelsea we've had five players have it in the last year havertz was really badly affected but ruben mm. got it conte got it pulisic got it more people i don't remember it's been a lot and it's been at every club like arsenal how, how are arsenal dealing with this adam what do you think about the vaccine situation there um well speaking particularly to arsenal i think it's 
it's quite concerning because I remember if you speaking of like players that I can think of off the top of my head who have had it. Uh, Gabriel, our centre back, had it, and he's only really just recovering now. And even when he came back and was fit enough to play, you could tell he had like lost mm-hmm. a bit of weight and he looked skinnier. And uh, I mean, of course, Mikel Arteta was you guys like sometimes cite like, he was he the guy who it. he started yeah. it. It's all his fault. So really, <laughs> yeah. let's blame Arsenal for something else. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. On a on a more serious note, I know Granit Xhaka has refused yeah. the vaccine, and Granit Xhaka is one of Arsenal's cl- uh, club captains. And quite often, like if Aubameyang isn't on the pitch, he'll be wearing the armband. And whatever you think about Xhaka as a player, he's a really influential personality in the dressing room. And then I'm thinking, well, what about the likes of sort of Bukayo Saka, Emil Smith-Rowe, all of these young kids who this guy, who for whatever reason hasn't received the vaccine, he's an influence on them. So I kind of worry about these leading personalities in the dressing room and what kind of what kind of message they're sending to their kind of the kids of the squad really and and obviously sorry one more thing on Arsenal and I'll shut up for a bit um, is Aubameyang uh, not only got uh, COVID but then also got malaria afterwards and was in hospital with malaria because of his compromised immune system and it's like I, I don't understand the psychology of a person who can see their teammate someone that they see day in day out and you would assume like at least or respect on some level going to yeah. hospital well, yeah yeah depending um <laughs> like yeah it, like go into hospital and suffer physically as a result of it and then just be like i'm all right thanks i i think i know better than all the science in the world <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah i mean that that's pretty much it right there you you don't know better than all the science in the world people of twitter so just go get the vaccine just just fucking shut up and then we can be y'all a little bit closer to back to normal but uh let's move on from there to our semi-weekly usually weekly check on racial issues in the game i don't really think we need to comment on this story particularly i just want to read out a player's specific words because they deserve to be sort of put out there into the public space former manchester united midfielder park ji sung has appealed to the club's fans to stop singing a song about him which contains a racial stereotype about his native south korea Uh, Park 40 said that the song caused him discomfort while at United, and he has made his peel after hearing away fans singing the song as Wolves unveiled their new Korean forward, Hwang Hee Chan, when they played in August. Quote, I'm really sorry for him to hear that. I have to educate the fans to stop that word, which is usually these days a racial insult to Korean people. Listening to the chant even 10 years later now, I feel sorry for the younger me who tried to overcome this discomfort that I felt back then. I also feel responsible for the young people who are still discriminated against as Asians or Koreans and struggling with that same kind of discomfort. So if you are a United fan uh, or you know United fans and you know that they're using that chant or that song about Koreans, uh, even if they mean it well because they used to sing it about their own player, uh, just don't. You know, he asked you to stop. Uh, So, you know, even if you did not know previously that that was a problematic word or a problematic stereotype in the song there, There you go. Now you know. Word's out there. So just cut that shit out, and we can go on with our lives. And we do have one other sort of racial-related story uh, shining a light on all those issues, and that is that a football fan who racially abused West Brom midfielder Romain Sawyers on social media has been jailed for eight weeks. Fuck yeah, let's go. Uh, A court heard Simon Silwood's Facebook message was intentionally racist and not the result of autocorrect. As he had claimed, famously, my phone tr- tries to autocorrect to horribly offensive words at all times. All the time, um, yeah. Annoying when happens. Silwood, 50, from Kingswinford, West Midlands, was also por- ordered to pay £500 in compensation to the player. Um, sentencing him at the Birmingham Magistrates Court District, Judge Bryony Clark, lots of good names this week, uh, <laughs> said there is no place for racism or racist abuse online. This clearly, in my view, crosses the custody threshold. I assess the remorse you have for your actions as very minimal Indeed. Quite the mic drop from the judge there. Uh, Fuck that guy. Again, his name was Simon Silwood of (laughs) Kingswordford, West Midlands. Uh, Just a trash person. Shout out that guy for being trash. And I'm glad that he's going to jail for even if it's a little bit of time and only a small fee. Um, Do either of you have anything to add about, again, that name was Simon Silwood? (laughs) 
<laughs> of Kings Winford West Midlands. Oh, other than being 51, just have your shit together more than that. Fucking hell. 51-year-old man. I mean, it's just... Yeah, just move on. It's just genuinely pathetic. <laughs> yeah, for the record, it doesn't matter that what age you are. Of course still it bad, doesn't. But, but, yeah, but, yeah. Of course it doesn't. But, you know, I, yeah. the older they are, well, I don't know, maybe they, they become to the threshold that they become elderly and you sort of let it go, which you shouldn't as well. But, you know, what, what is that threshold? When they he get to he like, reached the gammon threshold. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what we should call it. Yeah, absolutely. But Ian, 51... when did you feel like you reached that threshold? Was that like recently? Was that many years ago at this point? Like About when the back pass rule came in, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Well, on that note, let's transition to the main part of the pod, and that is the fixture rundown. We'll start things off, actually, with the big one. No need to uh, delay this at all. The big battle this weekend, and that was Pep Guardiola versus Mike Dean. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Liverpool 2, Manchester City 2, Liverpool 1.0 to Man City 1.1 on XG. A very, very fun very exciting and unbelievably even match. A bit of a tale of two halves here. Uh, let's start with the first half, and that was Man City taking control, dominating the first half. I believe Liverpool only had 0.02 XG at halftime, something like that. We'll get to Liverpool later and Salah's amazingness, uh, but Ian, why don't you start us off here? Talk to me about City. Talk to me about them dominating the first half. Talk to me about the lineups, the performance. What are your takes here? Well, not to flip it back on you, but I was sort of interested to see what you thought, because I said when Man City played Chelsea that while Chelsea were slightly in containment mode, I thought it was more a fact of Man City playing well. Um, and I don't think any team could have could have stopped them uh, when they were playing against Chelsea. Um, what do you think about Liverpool in this first half and whether it was whether it was a sort of stoic defensive perform performance to hang on because they were very I mean they would have been very happy to get into half time nil nil or whether Man City were irresistible other than finishing the goal narrative striker blah 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 uh the second one honestly right. I don't I don't give Liverpool any credit <laughs> just like I didn't give us any credit for like the yeah, way we enough. played against City uh City just fucking bossed them around Man, like, they just were cutting them apart. They were just poking and prodding all over. They had all of the ball. And it it, it was not a 0-0 due to Liverpool's excellent defense. <laughs> um, it, you know, not to jump on the hashtag narrative too much, but I think that, like, you can clearly fucking see a Harry Kane or last season Lionel Messi-shaped hole at the heart of Man City up front. And I think that if they had a more clinical finisher, I think if they had been the team to get Romelu Lukaku, for example... Um, they'd be even scarier. And I think despite that, they're still the scariest team in the world. Uh, and the this last week has definitively shown that for me, even if they didn't quite get the win here. Um, Adam, I'm curious to hear what you think, though. Do you think that that was more of like City dominating or Liverpool shooting the bed or some, some mix between the two? Like, where, where are you at on the first half? I, th I think it's a bit of like six of one, half a dozen of the other. Because if you look at the way Liverpool have played, certainly for most of the last know, like two, three seasons, a lot of their ball progression and like pressing intensity has come down the flanks and especially in their fullbacks. And when mm -hmm. you're missing uh, Alexander-Arnold and instead you've got Milner who, whilst is a great, like sort of, he's your typical kind of solid professional, he's not going to be able to do the kind of things Alexander-Arnold can do like on and off the ball. And I mean, my impression was he had like an absolute nightmare the kind of game where <laughs> the kind of game where how firstly how was he not sent off i don't really know um uh, three but, yellow cards could have had yeah, three exactly but also the kind of game where you're like yeah right okay let's not play milner at right back anymore because that's like not a good idea i think we can all remember games that have sort of like that have sort of retired a player and that felt like kind of <laughs> firmly closing the book on Milner anywhere other than in the middle of the pitch where he doesn't have to be tormented by the likes of Bernardo Silva. Yeah, he should be looking for a contract in the Australian League, I think, at this point. <laughs> See, uh, that that's about where Milner's at. <laughs> he had a oh. horrible, horrible day. Yeah, that must have been, he just like was sweating at home afterwards, just having nightmares about that performance. Oof. Um, but I don't think it's all Milner though. Like there was plenty of stuff going on in the center of the pitch too. Like yeah, the center, the mid midfield was basically static for Liverpool. Uh, they there was no movement or any th any thought to press at all. I mean, I presume Klopp just put a rocket up their ass at half time because they came out with much more energy in the second half. But 
yeah, they were they were very static and just letting letting um, Man City dance around them really. And as you say, Phil Foden had fucking Milner on toast all game, didn't he? I mean, it was pretty, it's pretty embarrassing. I'm, I'm surprised uh, you say you know um, that he shouldn't have or shouldn't have been there or shouldn't shouldn't play there again. I'm surprised it was as long as it was before they brought him off. And that was only when it was like, if you touch another player, he's going to send you off because yeah. he's going to yeah, realise yeah. the mistake he's made. So, you know, it was he, he lasted an amazing amount of time. I don't, I also don't think Milner cares. I think he would have got, gone home and gone, ah, it's fine. Yeah, he's seen it all at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, Didn't he, he, like, yeah, is he the one that made his debut in 2002? Yeah, you were stunned by that the other week. Yeah. Fucking insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A mere 10 years after the back pass rule came in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do we think that this is going to be a problem for City? That they didn't win here, despite being pretty much the better team, at least for the first half, significantly the better team, and then kind of fell apart? Like, is this a long-term issue? Is this not a big deal? They're just going to find ways to win anyway? Where are you at on City in terms of, like, going forward? I'll start with Adam here. I mean, I think we can all see the elephant in the room is going to be the striker thing, like, going forward. Uh, But, I mean, I think they can come out of this week of football, if you think they've played Chelsea, PSG, and Liverpool three of the hardest games they're going to have all season probably and they've probably been the better team in all of those games and they haven't always got the results that they would have wanted but I think whilst the not having a striker is obviously an issue because you just need it sounds really reductive to say but at the highest level of the game you just need somebody to score goals you can create all the chances you want and when you've got so many impressive creative players in a side it feels like a bit of a waste of them not to have a finisher there um mm. so i think that could cause them trouble like later on down the line but if i was a, if, I, if i was a man city fan i would be like pretty encouraged and certainly in terms of the performance uh based off the last week yeah i mean i i definitely agree that they were the better team in all of those matches but i do also think that like isn't that exactly kind of the problem is because they only took four points despite being the better team in all three of those matches, right? So like, yeah. So like, I don't know. Ian, what do you think? Like, are they going to just go out and spend all the money in the world in January? Well, I I think Kane was what, like their their pursuit of Kane was one of um, opportunity rather than anything. It's it's because they knew a good striker was willing to come to them. It's just, it turned out that it was, (laughs) that the prices weren't right either way. But it's, it's weird. I feel like there's because the there is a mainstream narrative that I mean uh, Alan Shearer was talking about it slightly ridiculously on match of the day. I thought, but um, in that he said if if they had a top uh, top striker, then they would score that striker would score forty goals a season in the Premier League. I was not sure about that, but anyway, um, it, it's so the narrative has become that. So then there seems to be a weird sort of football intellectualism thing going against that of oh well they won they won the league last season without a, a striker without a recognized striker playing all the time so that's not the case and i think the two aren't mutually exclusive you don't you know city can be absolutely amazing because of who they've got managing them because of the players they've got because of the systems they're able to play without there also being it being pretty clear that if they had a fox in the box out and out striker that they would clearly get on the end of more more things. I mean, I don't know if any of the players they've played in that in that false nine have ever really worked. It's always just been well, Man City are just too good not to win anyway. But it's right. still it's still a thing. I mean, I don't you know it's, it's still a thing. Do they need it? No, they don't. They've show, they showed last year they don't need it. But I mean, it's still it's still definitely a thing. Yeah, I mean, they're technically underperforming their XG. They're at 15 XG right now, 14 goals scored. So, like, even this early, they're sort of falling behind. And for a team as good as City, like, you would expect elite teams to overperform or at least meet their XG, right? So for them to be below is is kind of an issue for concern there. I thought Ferran Torres was doing a pretty good job for a second there, and then they just backed off that, but we'll see. Um, But let's take it to the other side of this one. Let's give Liverpool the credit where it is due. They were much the better team, I thought, in the second half. I thought that it was ridiculously exciting and fun to watch 
And holy fucking hell, man, that solid goal. Jesus. Sure. Can we just talk about that solid goal for a second? Adam, talk, you, you made a great face just now. I, Tell yeah. me about the solid goal. Well, it's one of those goals that, like you said, you made, you made a great face. Everyone had a face when that goal went in. And even me just saying it, people know the kind of face I mean. It's the, what, it's the type of goal that just makes you make a random noise. And afterwards, you're kind of like, <laughs> I don't really know how my body produced that sound. But, um, but no, I, it's it's just world class i don't really think there's any other word to describe it really and what uh liverpool have in salah is they've just got a game breaking player like your attack cannot be clicking particularly well and then you've got a player like him who is just capable of producing a moment that the one of the best defenses in the world just can't deal with like that little my favorite part of it was the bit the first move the kind of bit where he rolled over the ball with his foot and then just flicked it straight past was it bernardo Mm. silva it's just it's just so uh outstanding on so many levels the quick thinking the technical execution and like sort of the calmness to do that in such a big game uh, a big moment it's yeah i run out of words to describe it really yeah i mean i think uh messi-esque is not for once like going over the top that genuinely was like messi-esque or or hazard had a few of those one against liverpool and one against a different team um it, it, like it was just fucking the way he dropped his shoulder and the in and the out and the back and the forth how many ankles he broke like fucking hell do, they, do you guys call them ankle breakers over there or is that just a basketball thing no, I, I've not heard that as a. Okay, so if you cross someone up and then like they fall down or they like get all out of out of sorts because right. like you change direction on them too fast, it's called an ankle breaker. Okay, and he broke about fifteen ankles in that build up. That was fucking genius. The other goal too, though. Don't sleep on that man. His fucking yeah. pass for the Mane goal was well, out of control. Apart from the fact he passed to Mane for once. Yeah, well that too. <laughs> that yeah, was yeah, the yeah. most Is surprising this, oh, thing. Fuck. And then they celebrated together. It was like, oh, it's amazing. We're fucked. We're fucked if they're going to start playing with each other now, like yeah. playing together. But, no I mean, we, you, you spoke about them before as well as as we're going to be reaching the threshold of age, but it doesn't look like it's this season. Well, I mean, see, okay, here's my take, is I was like, <laughs> one of the three of them is going to fucking fall off a cliff, and is that going to be enough to derail them? Firmino is nowhere to be found, so yeah. it, technically his production did fall off a cliff. Who knows what's going on behind the scenes? <laughs> like, genuinely, maybe Klopp sees him, he lost a step. Maybe he's a little rusty. Maybe he's a little old, a little shaky, whatever. Hmm. But then fucking Jota comes in, and, like, it doesn't matter that Firmino's not there anymore. Yeah. If you if you had told me a year ago, or even six months ago, that they were going to be able to fade the loss of Firmino's productivity and still be the best or one of the best teams in the world, one of the best teams in the Prem, I would have laughed at you. And Jota is, like, just making a mockery of that. And he's young, too. So, like, if he can do the Firmino thing, or Adam, we were texting about this the other day. You said, like, not only is he doing the Firmino thing, he's also adding threat and adding shots and maybe missing some (laughs) some sitters (laughs) famously. But Liverpool scare me. I've been saying this for a few weeks now, and they continue Mm. to scare me. I don't know. Do you think that they're, like, the best team, the second best team? Like, where do you have them right now if you had to rank them one and two? They are one and two, right? I'm not. I know Chelsea are at the top of the well, table. This but... is the thing. Until very recently, I was putting them at four because I thought the transfer window had gone badly for them compared to other teams. But then Sancho's not hit hit the ground running at Man United. Um, he He's must not hit not... the ground at Man United. Dude, well, can't get a yeah. fucking minute. Has his flight even oh, landed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, he who must not be named was has been fairly static for a couple of games now, or not played. So I just. You know, I, I think, yeah, you probably do have to upgrade. I mean, you, you're you down on Chelsea at the minute, Oscar, so you're putting these two teams, Liverpool and Man City, at one, one and two. And I don't know yet about that. But, okay. yeah, they, they, I, I, I think I'll upgrade Liverpool to top three, certainly, rather than where I said a couple of weeks ago of four. Because, yeah, they do look they do look scary in attack. There's, there's no drop-off of Salah or Mane yet. And, like you say, Jota's filling in the gap for Firmino whenever needed. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the defence as well. I mean, I don't think you can take... You, well, this game was a weird one. But what was the XG? I'm sorry, you probably already said it, but what was the XG? 1.0 almost? to 1.1. So City just slightly beat them but out. But it didn't 1.0 feel 1.1. like there were huge amounts of chances conceded for, for either team, even though it was weirdly end-to-end and super exciting. Like, it didn't feel like there was, 
loads of missed chances or anything. You're shaking your head there, Roski. You think differently. The first half XG wasn't above one for either team. I think it was like yeah. 0.02 to like 0.7 or something. So you're not wrong. I just, this to me, at least watching it in real time, seemed like one of those situations where the, the non-shot XG would be much higher than the actual XG for right. the, as a very, very quick explainer for new, any new listeners. Uh, non-shot XG is basically like looking at all the variables other than the shot to see, you know, what sort of threatening situations and then trying to quantify that a team generated. And it City was perpetually in the Liverpool penalty area, and it seemed like they were just not quite getting that last shot off. But it looked very scary the entire time. I think they were very, very threatening. Adam, mm. what was your read on this? No, yeah, I, I kind of echo what you just said there, Oscar. It's like the kind of, there were so many almost opportunities and almost chances where like if the final pass goes through or if a right. ball falls another way, then then we're possibly talking a different story. In terms of where I rank the teams, I think whereas previously I was like, I, I don't know how to split Chelsea and City now and like you Ian I was sort of like oh yeah Liverpool transfer window hasn't gone great I also probably put them below United just because the quality of their signings on paper I think I mean even I could manage them to third place or certainly Champions <laughs> League um, and I am available Man United if you're listening yeah I'm a football manager you know I've taken um, taken Wimbledon to the Champions League you know I've got all that in my CV um, have you really yeah, 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 yeah. No, I have. Really? FIFA, That's FIFA 12, I think it was. Yeah. The best I've done is I took Dover, Dover Athletic uh, from the Blue Square South up to uh, League One, I think. And I was a hero in Dover <laughs> for a Ian, long time. Ian, that is the most fucking Ian story I can make. <laughs> It's like I took him as high as League One, this one very low down the pyramid team that no one has ever heard. Still, still will look for their results on Soccer Saturday. The champion um, of the pyramid. But there listen, he is. it was important because I, I used, to, I was such a purist on the football manager. And I think I can't remember what year of football manager that was that I used to start as an unemployed Sunday League footballer because Oof. I was like, that's what I am. <laughs> so, so I was like, I was, uh, the only team that would give me a job was Dover Athletic, and I had two stints there and was a. a it's probably a statue somewhere. I There's don't know, I haven't definitely some psychology to the fact that even in your fictional professional <laughs> soccer player life, you're like, nah, I'm not worth anything at all. Yeah. I'm the worst person in this <laughs> game. I'm trash. Um, <laughs> there's definitely a little bit there. But uh, speaking of trash, actually, there you go. Perfect transition. Uh, if, if there is a fatal flaw for Liverpool, it is their defense. Right? We were talking about their defense mm. and you were like, did they really cre- like concede a lot? They have the ninth best defense by the underlying numbers. They're below Palace. Or they're, they're tied with Palace for expected goals allowed. And Palace have had a much worse schedule than Liverpool. For the, well, I guess Liverpool played, played Chelsea and City, but they're fucking Liverpool. Do you know what I mean? Like, they shouldn't be ninth on defense. So yeah. I guess if they're going to win the title, they're just going to have to go full Liverpool and, like, 3-3 every match. Just like Liverpool of old. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's just kind of kind of where we're at. Well, An amazing if... match, though. Like, d- just one of those that I was texting my friends afterwards, and I was like, yep. That's why I love soccer. That match right there. Um, speaking of things that made me happy over the weekend, I don't know. We're just going to jump around and we will go to Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea 3, Southampton 1. Chelsea currently in first place in the table. 3.7 to 1.4 on XG. So if anything, a 4-1 scoreline would have been slightly more reflective, but 3-1 feels right. Um, one of the stories there is the red card, right? Southampton going down to 10 men for a very naughty tackle. Uh, by James Ward-Prowse, I believe it was. Is that right? Yeah. The one that got sent off? Yeah. Uh, trying to break some ankles there, but the old version of it, not the fun version of it. Um, Chelsea, much the better side, but it's just Southampton. I'm not overly sort of reading into it too much. But uh, Adam, as an Arsenal fan and someone who dis- just passionately despises Chelsea, give me your takes, both about this game and on them overall in the season. Where are you at on Chelsea? Yeah, I think... Um... I mean, I think Southampton can, they're a deceivingly tricky fixture for some of the like kind of higher ranked teams because like they caused, uh, like they drew against City this season already and uh, they gave Man United a pretty good game as well. So um, I think they can be quite a, perversely, they're quite a good or they're quite a hard team, sorry, for some of the better sides to play against normally. Um, And yeah, like you say, I think Chelsea were, by far the better side. I thought the James Ward Prowse tackle was pretty horrendous. It looked really, really nasty. Um, 
and yeah right decision there uh upgrading that to a red card uh, um chelsea in general i'm i started off the season terrified of them like just kind of with the addition of lukaku especially i think he's probably one of the best strikers in the world obviously he still is um and then watching that arsenal game i became even more terrified both of what chelsea <laughs> could do and of what arsenal could do um like you see the way he toys with defenders it's almost it's it's kind of rude in a way like <laughs> it's it's quite disrespectful to what he did to poor Pablo Marie that day he bet, we're talking about performances that kind of retire players i think that's Pablo <laughs> yeah. Marie certainly retired um his movement his uh sort of speed his decision making is uh, is really really good and what he's come back from italy with I think is a really good appreciation for space, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And his link up play is so good. And you saw that in the Southampton game, even though he, I think he only had one shot in that game and I'm not even sure if it was on target or his sort of shot totals were quite low, but the work he did off the ball and in the build up was just like exceptional. It's like you were saying earlier, Oscar, it's the kind of thing that maybe, uh, maybe Man City could do with, um, and obviously, like listening to you guys the past couple of weeks, I know Oscar, you've been increasingly a little bit kind of a little bit nervous, a little bit worried about how things are going. But I just think the quality of the player and the quality of the manager is such that not not that it can't fail, but it's it's pretty hard to see Chelsea not pushing City kind of really, really close for the title and not making it to like the kind of semi-final stages of the Champions League unless the draw is kind of horrendous and injuries strike and, and I mean even then like Chilwell who I think most people pre-season would have thought right yeah. he's your starting left wing back uh Reese James he's your starting right wing back and they've sort of not been mainstays certainly of the uh of the Chelsea team thus far this season so yeah I think I think Chelsea are in a really, really good place, and uh, it it really pained me to say that. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, I appreciate you being honest there, because uh, <laughs> I'm sure that was quite painful for you. Ian, I've made a lot of a fuss about the three five two, three four three recently, mm. and then sort of attacking concessions we've made to try to bring Lukaku into the team tactically. Um, this was a switch back to the three four three, or rather the three four two one. Um, with two people flanking him, including notably Timo Werner, who had maybe his best performance in a Chelsea shirt, I would say. Up there, yeah. Um, getting the late winner, the cursed child himself, a goal <laughs> disallowed on VAR. Uh, everybody does that making the rounds that he's had more goals disallowed for Chelsea on VAR than he's actually scored for Chelsea. Uh, that was his 16th disallowed goal. <laughs> um, so, you know, pretty, pretty fucking hilarious at that point. Uh, what what did you think? What did you think of Chelsea's attacking performance here? Did was it like back to what I've been wanting to see with the three four two one? Do you think that it was just like lucky? Do you think I don't know? What, where are you at on this? To give me no, give me I some think, praise, make me feel nice. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean you're going into the international break, top of the league. I mean you can't you can't feel too bad, surely. But it was uh, yeah exactly what Adam said. I mean Chilwell um, had a really good game when he's been out in the cold didn't enjoy his well I say didn't enjoy I was about to say didn't enjoy his time with England that's maybe a little bit harsh but he didn't get a minute did he and that's not what players want so he probably felt a little bit low when he came back and then Alonso was playing very well Chilwell starts the game concedes a penalty it didn't look great <laughs> terrible to start terrible with, penalties awful. just such a dumb decision just yeah. so dumb oh it was you know yeah exactly it was it was a dumb thing to do and it was a stonewall penalty so it was like it was looking like oh god right Alonso's going to be straight back in the team but then he didn't put much of a foot wrong for the rest of the time you had uh, as you said Werner um consistently his game seems to not just be about scoring goals, even though he scored loads when he was in the Bundesliga. But here at Chelsea, he's going to have to, well, he's going to have to take a slight back seat to Lukaku, but they're going to need him. You know, Chelsea are going to have a lot of fixtures if they go deep in the Champions League, which obviously we assume they will. There's there's going to be a lot of fixtures. He's going to need to be used. And um, to be honest, it was an interesting performance because... I, th I thought Chelsea's 
uh, range of things they were doing were was good as well. Sometimes you were very wide and um, you know flying down the flanks, and other times you were cutting inside, seemingly uh, getting getting inside Southampton when they really didn't expect it. It was. Yeah, it was it was it was an interesting one tactically. You know me, I'm pretty basic, uh, pretty basic when it comes to to tactics. But it was just, it was the it was the range of of balls that were being played. Still, Lukaku wasn't necessarily getting the service you'd you'd want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we are still seven games in. You know, let's and he's a new striker. Let's not worry unduly. I think I thought it was a. a professional performance from Chelsea and I think it was the sort of thing you needed going into the international break being as what you'd had recently yeah I mean I couldn't I couldn't really agree any more than that um we looked good we looked genuinely good we played them off the pitch even before the red card we were a much the better team um I continue to think that we look better when Timo's on the field mm. I think he stretches the play he creates so much space for everybody else those you know those interpassing and all that Stuff that you were talking about just now, Ian, like that doesn't happen if the if Southampton can stay compact. Yeah. Um, which I think Timo offers so much in that regard. Obviously, he scored, which is great. You love to see him score. But even when he doesn't score, he gets a ton of assists, and he's just always dangerous. And he occupies one or two defenders at all times. They have to think about him. They have to move with him. Mm. And it just moves everything else open. Um, to sort of address your Lukaku thing, I think that that's more tactical than him and his play. Oh, yeah. At this no, point. I agree. Yeah. I think they're using him more as a facilitator and a back-to-goal sort of backboard creator type guy. Um, once they sort of iron that out, I'd expect that we'll start seeing the goals yeah, come more. You're, you're absolutely right. It, it just feels slightly weird when the last season the narrative was that Chelsea have got lots of XG and aren't finishing them. Right, that, exactly. To, to then have that out-and-out striker and him be playing this back-to-goal sort of... It, yeah. it just feels a little odd at the minute. But I, I, I don't think it's necessarily bad, but it just feels a little bit weird at the minute. I mean, I would go to say that it seems a little bad to me. At least that's what I've been worried about, right? Like that's well, yeah. it's the three five two, it's the tactics, it's the yeah. sort of threatening look. And this was back. This went back to three four two one, and we looked fucking great. So I'm over the moon. Obviously, love to be in first place. Mounts back. Mounts back. Uh, Pulisic will probably be back after the break. Reese James will be back after the break. All sorts of players coming back, which is nice. Yeah, I just think Mount makes you tick from a tempo point of view massively. Mm. Like he just yeah. speeds speeds things up, and yeah. I think I think if you've got him and Werner running off as well, I just think you you're gonna bamboozle a lot of defenses. I think. I hope so. I hope so. Um, let's keep going then down the fixture rundown. Uh, let's go to Adam's team. Let's go to uh, Mr. Simpson. Can you actually please cue the jingle here? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're better than they ought to be. Burnley of the week. It was nil nil. I know, it's <laughs> very hard say, to get Burnley of the Week in a nil-nil, but we had Brighton nil, Arsenal nil, <laughs> Brighton 1.4 to Arsenal's 0.5, so triple the XG there, and still <laughs> still locking down a point there, Adam. How you uh, how are you feeling with that nil-nil? You feeling good? Get that point? You know, a, a point away at a sort of table-topping side, you know, you can't complain <laughs> about it. Um, no, yeah, I mean, I think, I think Brian could have gone top if they had won this game, so, yeah. I mean... And like I, I was messaging you, Oscar, I kind of don't want to go into a bit of a diatribe and a moan about Arsenal without first acknowledging that point. Like, yep. Brighton, Brighton are good. Like Brighton are quite good. And they were good last season and now they're actually finishing, which is kind of good. Uh, yeah, yeah, them. exactly. And I think I think Graham Potter set them up excellently well. I like You could tell, unlike the Spurs game uh, the previous week where Nuno kind of set up really bizarrely and quite terribly to be honest um like brighton targeted arsenal with like a really like high up press they weren't letting us play out from the back at all like they positioned i think like maybe four forwards constantly around the edge of the area from our goal kicks and Mm -hmm. when you consider two of our three goals against spurs effectively came from aaron ramsdale building it out from the back that it's clear that they had uh, they had done their research um, and forced Ramsdale to go long, and at that point, what is he doing? He's kicking it up to Pierre Emerick Aubameyang to compete against Duffy, Dunk, uh, Webster. I think was playing as well, who were like all over six foot four, and I think Aubameyang 
won like one aerial duel all game. So there you go. They yeah, I think that kind of pretty much tells the tale of the story. They they pressed really well. They kind of targeted our key strength and used it and like tailored their game plan around it. And I think I think just honestly, I think Graham Potter set them up excellently. Yeah, now that Chuck's not here, we can actually say nice things about Brighton. They're really <laughs> oh, fucking good. I I kind of like Brighton. He's gonna yell at us next week when he comes back <laughs> for saying this. But I Brighton are kind of fun, man. I don't know. Like I don't. No, I'm yeah, a fan yeah. of the Brighton. It Brighton should Brighton definitely should have won. Like I yeah. came out of that and was thinking like, phew, thank God, uh, a point there is is a really really good result. And I thought like if I was looking for rays of positivity from that game specifically, I thought Emil Smith Rowe was like excellent again. I think yep. he's probably been our best player this season. Um I like his technical security on the ball. It's it's sort of a bit like Mount in a way. They're not too similar a type of player, but they're the kind of cog that you need in a machine because they're they're so, like I say, technical security. They're so safe in possession, but they also have that instinct to kind of drive play forward and create. And mm. I think that's something that we sorely lacked uh, in the rest of our players uh, against Brighton. Um, who, like, just shout out to uh, Cucurella, Cucurella, yeah. whatever. That's like the best left back performance I can ever remember. He was absolutely outstanding. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that game, I was very relieved to take a point out of, basically, yeah. All right, uh, and we generally don't really talk about Arsenal enough, to be honest, because like I don't really have opinions on them, and the other two guys aren't going to force the issue on me. <laughs> um, but this is a safe space. Chuck's not here. <laughs> you, can, you can speak freely, and no one will uh, will punish you. Why don't you give us a little bit on Arsenal? We haven't talked about them almost at all this season, so like, what's the state of Arsenal? Vent if you need to vent. Praise who you need to praise. Where, where, where are you at? Give us a therapy session here. I mean, like, starting with the positives, uh, because that's quicker. Um, <laughs> like, I think I think what was proven is I remember listening to your transfer review episode, and I think you were quite, you were kind of a little bit harsh, shockingly, on Arsenal's uh, <laughs> summer business. I think the players that we've brought in have done really, really well. I think Odegaard has proved to be an excellent signing and an excellent value um, for like such a young, creative player. Uh, I think Ramsdale has been really, really good. He came up with a key interception in this game. Good. Yeah, yeah, no, and he surprised me as well because I was really kind of on the fence about the signing and on the fence was being generous. Um, but he's kept three clean sheets in his four games and I read somewhere that took Leno 20 games to reach three Oof. clean sheets. Oof. So, um, <laughs> Ouch. And I think he's he's bringing a presence in the area that Leno lacked. Um I think Tommy Yasu largely has been great again, sort of didn't have the best game against Brighton. Yeah, but yeah he's looked good, yeah. Yeah, uh, no Arsenal player did. Um, See, so yeah, I think the signings have been good. Um, in terms of like negatives, it's the chance creation again. We're just not, we're not creating enough chances. Um, and we're still too, uh, the chances we do create, I, I think I still feel like we're too reliant on Aubameyang being the Aubameyang of like two seasons ago and every time you speak about Liverpool in terms of age curve I kind of have to hold my tongue a little bit because I realise we've put 300k a week into an ageing striker who is probably on the wrong side of that age curve hmm. and we, do, we don't have a we don't have a backup who's ready to step up um, so that that is still a real real big issue Um I can sort of see the signs of the identity that um, Arteta wants to play. And there's always that talk of the process and in Arsenal Twitter, like the kind of trust the process is almost become a meme at this point because <laughs> Arteta would just say it like at the end of a hammering <laughs> against Man City. It's like, okay, if this is the process, I think we need to review that. Um, yeah, like how long is the process? Dude's been there for like five years at this point. Like, yeah. He's got to get to the end of the process at some point, right? Like, where? Ex Exactly. And I think what this start has been, I think we've, we're on 10 points. I think 10 points is fine. Like, it's just fine. It's not great. It's not terrible. I mean, I predicted we would lose the opening day against Brentford. Uh, so I wasn't surprised really by that. And then losses against Chelsea and Man City, objectively, that's like, yeah, you probably expect that as well. Um, so yeah, I think 
I think 10 points is pretty much par, really. And that's that's really where Arteta is right now, which feels weird to say like two weeks or a week after hammering our sort of North London rivals. Arteta is now at par, I think. And um, the next run of fixtures, I don't think we really have a kind of objectively tricky game until Liverpool in November. Mm. Um, okay. So I think this this next little period, if we want to like compartmentalize it, um, is where Arteta really needs to prove himself. I still don't think, by any means, he is like air quotes safe in the job. I just yeah. don't think he's at risk anymore. If that no. makes sense. Gotcha. Okay. I think, yeah, that makes sense. I think you. I saw you tweet something interesting about um, how with Brentford's performances recently you should reframe how we thought about the opening game. And um, I think you're right with that because we all got taken along with the uh, the romantic story of the Friday night opening Premier League game at the new Brent- Brentford Stadium, you know, and uh, this club that hadn't been in the top flight for whatever it was, 70 years, and then winning. And... Mm. I th- I think you're right. Based on how Brentford have been performing in subsequent games, um, that that did just kick off an easy narrative, which I very much subscribe to as well. <laughs> I was like, you know, yeah. Arteta could be in trouble here because I said I think at the start of the season that I think there's a few managers who have to kick on this year to save their jobs. Arteta being one. Uh, Graham Potter being another who definitely has mm. and I can't remember the other one probably Watford or something and um, <laughs> yeah. like, and you know it, it does look a lot less bad now we see that Brentford are a genuine Premier League prospect as in mm. you know unlikely to go down I don't even mean this as a troll oh god Brentford <laughs> might be the second best team in London right now at least <laughs> on form on like performances by underlying numbers it's them or West Ham. Yeah, I was going to say, the only thing I would say there is that's probably harsh on West Ham and maybe even harsh on Palace. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but Brentford just beat West Ham. This is a good place to transition to the next match. West Ham won, Brentford 2, West Ham 1.4 to 1.3. So, you know, they were even on XG. They got the variance there. They got the second goal. An exciting finish there, mm. um, if I'm remembering correctly. And uh, and I think that that was, uh, I think the double pivot guys were calling this like the battle for second best in London. And I don't disagree. I, I genuinely like Brentford are looking pretty fucking amazing. Um, but what about the West Ham side of this? Because we just kind of spent a few minutes praising Brentford. And I think we're exactly right, too. I think they're a really, really good fucking team. Um, but talking about West Ham. West Ham losing to Brentford here. West Ham dropping off a bit after a very, very strong start to the season. Down to ninth at this point, And a lot, two losses and two draws in their last five. What, 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 what's up with West Ham? Isn't this kind of what most people were predicting before the season? Like European football starts up, they've got a relatively smaller squad and perhaps the performances just start to drop off. I mean, I think West Ham, like West Ham were really, really good to start the season. Um, but yeah, like I say, you, you see this quite a lot with, and this isn't meant to disparage West Ham, um, but with sides who aren't possibly used to European football they they tend to start that season really quite well because they've got that kind of morale boost of yeah we've got European football we've taken a step up last season let's really kick on um, into the next season and then the realities hit and it's not just the kind of increased uh, fixtures that they have to put up with it's the change to the training schedule uh, the increase, like the travel, there's less rest time. I don't think that often gets like spoken about. It's not just the fact that you have to play 90 minutes on a Thursday and then 90 minutes on a Sunday. It's that impacts like your training. So you've got less time on the training ground to work on kind of your rigid tactical moves, which I think is something probably Moyes spends a lot of time in, uh, mm. time on rather. Um, so yeah, I think it's just kind of a natural drop off. Uh, that is a consequence of a smaller squad um, like coping with European football for the first time, to be honest. I'm not sure if you guys think any differently. Uh, I think the Europa League is a plague and shouldn't exist. <laughs> uh, like it, it only fucks teams up. And no, no, like that's extremely harsh on the like tier two level sort of big clubs. But no fucking cares about the Europa League. It's just extra fixtures that no one fucking wants. 
And now they added a third one, too, which is like, come on, give me a fucking break. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I agree with you, Adam, completely. I mean, we've seen that with Burnley, right? That was a few years ago. We mm-hmm. saw that with Leicester. Teams have historically struggled in the Europa, um, as opposed to like in the Champions League, which, you know, is a certain, certainly a higher level of team on average than the teams that sneak into Europa in like your sixth place or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it, like you said, it's, it's, it's the preparation. They have two days to prepare for a match and then two days to prepare for the next match. So like, even from the video sessions, from sitting and analyzing your opponent and like coming up with a specific game plan and really drilling it in, having a week to prepare for one opponent as opposed to three days or two days with rest to prepare for an opponent, massive, massive difference. And and I think that's only exacerbated by the kind of uh, eh. compacted, oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> yeah, by like <laughs> the the kind of condensed football calendar that we've had in general. Like players have barely yeah. had a rest, and the teams. Like teams are much more tactically advanced. Like Brentford are a level above tactically to say like like a Fulham uh, from last year. And I was about to say not to be mean to Fulham, but yeah, no, to be mean to Fulham because they're pretty terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, you, like like you say, the video analysis, all that kind of preparation that needs to go in has increased. And you look at players like Declan Rice, who is sort of pivotal to what West Ham do and what they want to do this season the guy's barely had a break he's he's a young player and he needs time off I can speak from like an Arsenal perspective Bakayo Saka looks knackered at 60 minutes in every game mm-hmm. uh, but he's so important to what Arsenal do he can't he can't ever be rested and Declan Rice is Declan Rice is the same and I think uh that's only unfortunately for them that's probably only really going to get worse as the season goes on uh fair enough then let's take it to actually uh our beloved chucks team and the other potentially second best team in london at the moment and that is uh crystal palace getting a result against leicester man the crystal palace run of results just continues uh palace two leicester two palace 1.3 to leicester's 1.7 so a pretty fair result i mean two one if you're like really rounding uh, would be slightly more reflective, but like this is well, well, well within the realm of reason given the per- the underlying numbers here. What the fuck is up with Palace? They sh- they're supposed to suck. <laughs> Chuck's not here. We could talk about them for real. What the fuck is going on here? Well, you, you, yeah, you're right. They are supposed to. But like, what was funny about this game was that um, when Le- Leicester scored their first two goals, it was against the run of play. Palace... Yeah. were playing really well in that first half and had been unlucky. And I feel like a previous Palace team would have crumbled there, no problem. That would have they would have probably gone down three or four nil. And yeah. that that would have been it. And um and you know they didn't. They kept they kept fighting for it. I mean as well as because the uh the goals were born of mistakes as well. They could have easily let their heads drop. But um, no, I think they did really well. I haven't got a, a great deal to say other than this was quite a fun match to watch as a lot of the football was this this week. Great weekend. Great yeah. weekend for the Prem, mm. genuinely. It really Palace was. 60% possession here. Palace 18 shots to nine. Like Palace bossed this match like pretty comprehensively, I thought. Yeah, and I think if we're like praising Graham Potter, I think Patrick Vieira deserves like a lot of credit because yeah. like, the way that he's and there was a lot of skepticism, I probably me included, um, and I'm sure you guys were a little skeptical as well of what he would be able to do with uh Palace coming into this season. But the way he's turned around that kind of perception, not only in terms of like performances, but the results have been pretty, pretty good. And like they're they're looking really good. His subs are making a difference, like the two subs scored, and that's kind of classic box tick for new manager uh cliche mm-hmm, there mm-hmm. um but yeah no i think i think palace are palace are good and i think it's okay to it's okay to start saying that god damn it <laughs> <laughs> do we think they'll finish europa just top half what, what where do we have them at the yeah, moment steady on yeah um, i was gonna say they're, good. they're, not, they're not that good <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. I mean, yeah. I, I think they absolutely could could finish top half. We'll see because it's it's seven games, but the players look like they're certainly the players like um, Zaha that have been there a long time and played under Hodgson for a long time. They they look like they're having fun and uh, are enjoying the fact that they're able to to go forward and create a little bit more 
um conor gallagher looks brilliant um mm. do you what's the deal with him oscar do you know if there's any sort of like uh um like obligation to buy or like, you know, what's uh, the deal is it just a i straight don't loan? know i think it's just a straight loan i don't know for sure right. Chuck okay. would be the one to ask that, but I'm pretty sure it's just a straight loan. Yeah, they'll be looking to make that permanent, I would have thought, oh, yeah. he's so good, yeah. Oh, um, speaking of uh, Chelsea loan prayers to Palace, actually, just to rewind a second to the Chelsea match, fucking Ruben looked really good. Yes. This was maybe Ruben's yes. best, Ru- That's a good this point, was maybe actually. Ruben's best performance in a Chelsea it, shirt. And, and tell you what, Barkley came on and did things <laughs> oh, as well. Yeah, well, if Tuchel can get something out of Barkley, then just man- best manager of all time, right there. But Easy. That, I can't remember which piece of play it was for, but he made like a, a amazing pass, just like yeah, over, it was the Timo but, goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he played to Aspi, and then yeah, absolutely. That, that is like I was kind of like rubbing my eyes. Is like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Record scratch. Wait, is that Ross Barkley and not like kind of peak Cesc Fabregas who made that pass? It was like amazing. <laughs> Um, Admittedly, I will say I got angry in the second before that. Both me and and the good Dr. Emily were sitting there and we were like, he winds up to hit it. I mean, he's going to hit it some distance, right? And we were like, fucking Barkley taking a shot from 40 yards as fucking usual. And then it was this inch perfect, beautiful. Oh, my God. Speaking of the weird sounds that come out of you, just that whole sequence (laughs) with Timo getting the late winner, all of it. Oh, my God. Sounds. Sounds galore. Can I just say how absolutely furious Chuck will be that we are talking about Palace <laughs> and then have managed to pivot to Chelsea. Yeah, of He's course, going to be of course. absolutely furious. He's going to have a lot of things to be mad about, but he had a real good time at Disney. So, it, you know, yeah. it all balances out. Uh, let's wrap up the week here. Uh, and we'll do this very brief because neither I nor Adam really want to say anything about this team. And that is Spurs getting a win against Villa. Tottenham 2, Aston Villa 1. Tottenham, 1.7 to Villa's 1.1 on XG, so it deserved 2-1. And the big story for me here was Harry Kane continuing to get a lot of shots. Um, I think he got six shots in this one, if I recall correctly. Uh, I think previously he had five shots in the first, like, five matches, and then five in the one before this, and then six in this one. Uh, If Kane's going to continue to get shots, are we concerned at all, Adam, about Tottenham potentially making noise in among the London clubs, at least. I don't know. I think I think Son is the one that I would be more sort of concerned about. He's uh, continuing to, like we were talking about earlier, Salah being a bit of a game breaker. Son is kind of showing that that's sort of what he can be for Spurs. And in Kane's uh, absence, I guess, in terms of like putting in good performances, I think maybe he having signed a contract extension and kind of like committed to Tottenham is like, yeah, maybe, maybe I can be the, the main man. Um, I don't really know if I'm concerned about Spurs cause I just look at their, I think their defense, especially, I don't think you can be starting a premier league game with Eric Dyer as <laughs> one of your center backs and seriously have like aspirations of European football or certainly Europa <laughs> League football. I, I think he's a dreadful, dreadful footballer, to be honest. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't yes. know if I'm concerned. Certainly, like, when I look at them from a tactical perspective, I don't really think Nuno's got... He's like Jose Mourinho light, in a way, just, like, less of a dick, I guess, um, <laughs> in kind of the way he sets them up. So, so no, I'm not concerned yet uh, that they're going to be kind of doing too well this season but I mean I guess if I was a Tottenham fan and looking for a silver lining like you say Harry Kane upping his shot numbers uh and Dombele I thought did he showed flashes of like decent form um and Son continuing to be excellent really yeah those were the positive things I thought for Spurs all right well let's put you on the spot here since you're our our esteemed guest do you finish above Tottenham this year (sighs) Well, the the thought of saying no makes me really, really depressed. So I kind of have to say yes. I, I don't think I could have much hope and look forward to the rest of the season if I thought Arsenal were going to finish below Spurs. So I'm going to say yes. All right, fair enough. Uh, Ian, should uh, should we not answer that question just to be nice, sir? Well, no, I, I don't know. It depends. I mean, according to The Athletic, um, Nuno's especially motivated because uh, if... If he doesn't finish top six, apparently they don't have to pay him any compensation and can get rid of him. Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting one. Nuno's going to be motivated. 
ringing uh. endorsement, signing the contract. It's like, yeah. By, by the way, we're just going to slip this clause in here. Don't, don't, don't read too fine a detail. We're just, yeah. hey, we talked it over with your agent. So it's worth millions of pounds to him to finish in the top six. That's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> That's really not like Tottenham and no offense, Adam Arsenal are not the six, in the six best teams in the league. Like they would be very lucky for either of them to finish that high up. I think. I don't know. But Leicester, it, it, like, like Nuno's getting fucking fired, bro. Like, come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, Nuno's getting fired, and like Arteta, I'm not entirely confident sees out the season. But like Leicester, you know, they're yeah. no no great shakes at the moment. Um, West Ham, like we were talking about, the European football is that drags on could tire them out. Leeds not started too well. Uh, kind of look at the contenders for the top this six. This is true. And yeah, this is true. Outside the top four, all of those sides, like the kind of sides you would say could finish fifth and sixth, are showing signs of weakness, I would say. Yeah, it is definitely going to be a wide open race for that fifth spot. I think you got Everton in there. Obviously, they're in yeah. fifth right now, but I think their performances have been pretty good. Mm. My money would be on Brighton and Brentford. Honestly, to round out the top six this season. Really? Um, yeah. I, it's a I huge shout, Oscar. That you throw good, that out man. there so simply, but that is a huge shout. This is, this is going to be one of those things when Brentford are like 16th in January. Ian's <laughs> going to play like a kind of dream music and it's going to cut back to this audio. And then everyone in sort of future podcast is going to laugh their asses off. Just yeah, I mean, no one takes my take seriously at this point. Everybody <laughs> knows, so it's fine. I can say things, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. All right, well, um, that seems like enough fixtures. I don't really want to talk about any of the other teams particularly. Uh, and this would normally be the part where I hand off to Chuck to do, like, a quiz, and he does his little outro, and then the particular league and all that. <laughs> oh, his little um, outro, yeah. <laughs> All I fucking know is that I'm done with hosting duty, so I'm going to throw it to Ian, and you can figure out what the fuck comes next from here. <laughs> the, the, only th- the only thing I wanted to talk to, because it's, it's where we met, as in the three of us, and then Adam as well, we all, we all sort of became embroiled in FPL Twitter. So how's your FPL team doing, Adam? That's what I wanted to ask. Uh, uh, that noise kind of yeah that noise kind of summarizes it um i thought i started off quite well um like in a kind of reverse of arsenal season i think i got like 95 points in the first game week which i know like everyone scored quite highly but no i, I did quite well um and then, ironically, ever since I've wildcarded, it's like kind of gone gradually downhill. I think I wildcarded at about sort of like two hundred, three hundred k because I thought, oh wow, this season not I'm bad. not going to be, I'm not going to be scared. I'm going to wildcard from a position of strength. I'm going to trust yeah. myself, and that proved to be a terrible idea because <laughs> I'm now like I think maybe four or five weeks later, I'm now five hundred and seventy k. Um, oh, hello. See you there. I'm 573k at the minute. Oh, God, yeah. I thought things were bad enough already. <laughs> yeah, near Ian. Um, so what yeah. I'm hearing, Adam, is you're the West Ham of FPL. You're, you've got a strong start, but you've gotten distracted by uh, continental duties, or in this case, losing to me in fan tracks. Oh, um, and you and have it's really to bring that your... up as well. <laughs> What's even worse is you had messaged me, I think on the, is it the Saturday like evening UK time, Saying, "Oh yeah, it's looking pretty even in our in our battle," and then you just absolutely destroyed me on the Sunday. I don't even think it was yeah. close in the end. Um, no, and I mean, I have KDB and Cancelo and Mane, so you yeah, know, and that was a bit of a. I'm pretty sure tomorrow's going to go well, so I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> rub it in now. <laughs> oh dear, but yeah, no. Um, fantasy wise, all round, it's like both that fan tracks draft and FPL. It's uh, it's not going to too brilliantly at the moment. I think. There's a lot of kind of talk at the moment about people trying to get in Lukaku in FPL. I already had him in. I had him. I was tempted to get him for that Arsenal game because it was the kind of thing where I was saying all during the week, if he plays against Arsenal, he's definitely going to score. And sure enough, we all know what happened there. Um, so yeah, I'm did he happy. score? I don't remember. Yeah, shut was up. It, shut was up. it a good day for him? <laughs> or, uh... Don't bite. Don't bite. <laughs> oh dear. Um, so yeah, so I've got Lukaku in. I'm feeling pretty strong about that. I've got Rudiger and Aspilicueta, so I'm like... Oh God, you've got the same three Chelsea I've got. Yeah. yeah, all in on the kind of Chelsea are actually really good bandwagon. Um, I'm not really touching any United players. Like I ditched Luke Shaw this week and I'm probably going to sell Mason Greenwood pretty soon as well. Yeah. Uh, 
and and yeah, those are those are the kind of main main sort of teams I'm I'm looking at at the moment. Like I really don't want to triple up on Arsenal, uh, and I <laughs> I set myself. Good a Lord, room. are you doubled up on Arsenal? <sighs> well, Adam, well, come on, man, Oscar, Adam, don't Oscar, do this to yourself. Let me stop you because I was delighted to hear Adam uh, waxing lyrical about Smith Rowe because I made a transfer on the Saturday before an international break and went Billy Gilmore to Smith Rowe. Uh, and I've already got Ben White, so I'm now double up on <laughs> Arsenal. Good Lord. No <laughs> wonder you're both at 500 I, Okay, it was after the North London derby. I had had a few drinks and Smith Rowe <laughs> looked so good. And I was like, mm. I kind of Mate. like it. I want him anyway. And Mate, so I was there's like, a price rising coming. We're going to be laughing. Exactly. Don't worry about that. Exactly. Um, and then Kieran Tierney. I will also be laughing, but <laughs> 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 your teams. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, so. Um, I've I'd done so well to like emotionally disconnect myself from like <laughs> FPL and Arsenal up to that point. And then now I'm just like, I got to that point where I hate watching an Arsenal game with FPL investment. But then there was the Smith Rowe chance against Brighton towards the end of that match, you know, where he ran through and he could have played in Saka and instead he shot and it was kind of a little bit tame straight at the keeper. And I was like, God, <laughs> God damn it. And then I looked at my <laughs> FPL team and I was like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah okay. I somehow well, managed to turn that back to Arsenal didn't I <laughs> it's fine it's fine I was going to turn it to Arsenal anyway because that was my transfer so. <laughs> yeah. I was only going to do exactly the same okay well I guess we ought to wrap it up then we ought to do a quick uh, Patreon shout out uh, if you want to help us carry on with this nonsense then you can go to patreon.com slash pod. I've not done a Patreon shout out for ages Chuck usually does it these yeah, days yeah Chuck's, Chuck's the guy it's Really, yeah, yeah really taking it on but you can get on he even learned the website he did <laughs> to say yeah, the right one. I, know, I, I is... have yet to. It's either Miles Offside or Miles Offside Pod. I don't know which one, one of the two. Which Whatever, are unclear. Yeah. Uh, but you can get on at various levels. We've got an active Slack going on where uh, we'll do fantasy football advice and such nonsense and um, other things like your Oscar, your um, stats that you do as well with the fixture rater. We've been doing bets with the fixture rater, and I can't, I can't give you a current balance on the uh, mop. Uh, betting account but Chuck's registered some success I think we're doing yeah, quite yeah. well I think he said we've like quintupled our money since the start of the season just using my fixture rater so sign up I think that, that one's eight dollars a month if I'm not mistaken <laughs> yeah, it is eight dollars a month you can for make the your stats money robot so you too could have access to my patented not patented <laughs> it should be patented fixture rater uh, where I just look at XG and then basically tell you who gonna score and who gonna win and draw and yeah. uh, and Chuck's been using it to great effect putting absolutely. money absolutely and if you go up to the producer level, you can. Um, one of the perks is that you can decide on a topic for our international break episodes. And next week is an international break episode, so we're going to be calling our on one of our producers to nominate a topic, and uh, we will do some sort of deep dive or some sort of episode on said topic. But uh, that just leaves us to say uh, thank you, Adam, for filling in uh, so so well for Chuck. Um, where can people find you on Twitter and the like? Uh, yeah, well, no, thanks very much for having me. It's not been as tortuous as I would imagine. You were, you were pretty kind <laughs> to me, so I yeah. appreciate that. Um, you know, my Twitter handle is at 35who, so like 35 spelled out in letters, uh, and then who, because who wants to have an easy to find social media account nowadays? <laughs> I like it. You've slagged it off a lot, but I like it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Adam, for filling in for Chuck and. Uh, all that leaves us to say is I, I, I can do the music whenever I want and start the outro yeah, whenever up, I want. I'm in full control. I'll just, I'll just start the music now. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. There it is. So well, thanks very uh, much. Thank you. Thanks oh, very what? much. Uh, no. I don't know. You go. I, I don't know it. <laughs> I was right, going to pretend well, I know it. Thanks, Oscar. Say bye. Bye. Thanks, Adam, Adam, thank you so much for being on. It was an absolute pleasure. <laughs> thanks. Uh, bye. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, I've done it too early. Oh, thanks to Mark Daffin. I'm slowing down now. Johnny Werther's and Nate Whittam, who's off on deployment, protecting our freedoms. They're the producers. Thanks. Bye. Nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) That's harder than I realised, actually.